So welcome, Lisa Hakey from Great Clips, Vice President of Marketing and Communications for Great Clips. Yep. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, so for these CMO spotlights, we like to highlight fantastic marketers to really just understand, get to know them a little bit better. And so the first question is just if you'll tell us a little bit about your career path that led you to Great Clips. I, I know you, you've worked with some amazing companies along the way. So if you'll just tell us a little bit about your, your path. Yeah, well, it's certainly been a windy road, I'd say. So I started early in my career at the, with the Pillsbury Company. I'd studied international all through my undergrad and spoke Japanese and wanted to stick with that international aspect of business. So I worked in the international department of Pillsbury as they were launching brands in other countries and growing their business internationally. Uh, while I was there, I achieved my MBA from the Carlson School of Management, the U of M, and decided to explore other opportunities, was almost encouraged by my my leader at that time, just to at least see what else was out there. And I did, and I, I found 3M. And so I ended up getting recruited by 3M in an area called um, new, uh, uh, Strategic Business Development Group. What I liked about that, it wasn't, I would have gone into a very traditional marketing, consumer packaged goods marketing role at um, Pillsbury, but at 3M, it was more of an internal consultant type role was taking all that I had learned in that MBA program and being able to apply it in very different uh, marketing problems and opportunities and white papers. And um, it was a great development program just coming out of an MBA um, education to be able to leap into 3M and do that in just this huge company that had 40 plus divisions and, and opportunities. And then as I was there, I did a project with their dental division, 3M SB. They had just bought a company out of Germany and they were integrating that company um, into the 3M way. And there was an opportunity to jump over there. It brought me back to my international roots and I became a brand manager for dental products. Very exciting, but a fun industry to be in, uh, working with dentists from around the world. So. so do you speak German also in addition to Japanese? Uh, no, <laughs> no, which was a problem by the way, because the company <laughs> was in a small, small yeah. town. And so there was a lot of German to be spoken. And I, and I, I look very German. I'm, you know, when I was in Japan, they knew I wasn't Japanese, but, uh, <laughs> but in, in Germany, they just assumed I could speak their language. So um, but no, great experience there. I was at 3M for six years, working on a, ver a variety of really focused more on the early stage development of product as well as launching new products into market. So I got a lot of that product marketing experience. At the same time, my husband and I were working on a new business idea that we had, and we decided to take the leap. And we both left our jobs and we decided to become entrepreneurs and we launched a retail based business as a food based business and we sold kitchen gadgets, gift items, um, home good type items in a boutique type style. But then we also provided chef prepared meals uh, to busy people on the go. We, we were in that situation. We knew that was an unmet need out there. And so we decided to create a business that really fulfilled on that need. Uh, and so the retail business drove the traffic and then the solution helped people discover this uh, new opportunity to um, enjoy good food quickly at home. So we did that, we grew that, it was growing really fast. We had, we ended up with 14 locations in seven different states. Wow. Um, and that's because we became franchisors. So we decided the best way for us to grow with our limited capital was to begin franchising. So we worked through all of that. And, um, and it was great. It was a great experience and um, definitely earned my MBA all over, I would say, through being an entrepreneur, as you, as you probably well know. It's, it's not easy and had young kids at the time. Uh, then 2008 hit. At that point, we were trying to raise private equity. We had an investor. Long story short, he backed out. And so we decided we couldn't really follow our strategy that we needed to have long-term sustainable and profitable growth, which was very important. Mm -hmm. And so I exited the business and I was trying to find an opportunity that could both, I could both leverage that entrepreneurial innovative spirit that I had gained. And I, I knew I couldn't leave fully um, having already been an entrepreneur as well as have that, um, that, 
corporate structure and resources behind it to really enable you to, to, to follow through on strategies and build them out and take the proper time and investment needed. And so I talked to a colleague of mine, I told her what I was looking for, and she said, you know, a perfect place for you is Best Buy. It's still chaotic. It's still very entrepreneurial, but it's backed by this big, you know, corporate entity. And so sure enough, I found an opportunity at Best Buy. I worked on um, innovation, uh, experimentation in retail. So it was almost like starting your own business unit within a retail environment, trying new areas, categories for Best Buy to explore and, and doing the proper research, testing it seeing how it would launch, you know, really looking at it from a consumer, financial, and employee perspective. And it was a great opportunity. I was at uh, Best Buy for about nine years, worked in a variety of roles there. My last role there was leading marketing for the Geek Squad. Yeah. Um, so they're service-based business, and it's a great brand, really fun to work with. I relaunched the brand while we were there, uh, went through all new branding and creative brand identity, um, as well as just uh, really determining how it fit better into that whole Best Buy value proposition and, be, and making services a stronger part of that value proposition. And then out of the blue, I got a call about this company called Great Clips. I mean, obviously, I'm, it's a Minnesota-based company. I knew about Great Clips. I had never considered uh, joining the company, but I had a really good conversation with um, someone who said, hey, we're trying to find a new marketing leader and would love to talk to you. And I said, well, you know, it's always worth exploring new opportunities. Talked to them after several meetings, just really loved the values of the company, the opportunity to work for a smaller company and really have a leadership role where I could make decisions. And um, lo and behold, here I am. You had franchise and retail experience, which probably served you really well going into that role, right? Exactly, exactly. And so having that uh, franchisor experience yeah. as well as the retail big brand is what they were looking for. And culturally, culturally, it was just a really good fit for me. So cool. Yeah, it's well, been three years now. Yeah. And, and so I've got some questions about your role at Great Clips. But before we jump to that, so what is your superpower? Like Lisa, if there's one thing that you feel like you bring to the table that makes you unique or different or special? What's your superpower that you bring to the table? Um, I don't know how to say it in like superpower terms, but I would just say that I'm pretty fearless. I try anything once at least. And um, yeah, just being able to be fearless. Mine, mine is um, superhuman strength, but you know, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, I would like that. Is there, is there a piece of, of advice that you wish you'd gotten early in your career that, that would have benefited you today? Um, I would say just, you know, early on my career, I thought, and especially after uh, going to school and getting my MBA, I thought there was this very um, specific path that marketing professionals had to go on. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I was very tied to that path and, and thinking about that path and becoming a brand manager and doing all these things. And it's not true at all. And, and I can speak for that in my career because I definitely didn't take the traditional path. I didn't go the agency route. I didn't do any of those things. Um, but I still ended up in, in, the, in the spot that's right for me. So. Awesome. Um, so in terms of your current role, other than global pandemic, which is kind of obvious. What's the biggest challenge that you're facing in your current role that you didn't anticipate? Uh, in my current role, I would say it's just that, it's this, just that shift to digital. It's still, mm. it's, you know, for me coming from Best Buy, who was very digitally, you know, really focused on digital very early on, I would call Best Buy really a, a leader in digital. Yeah. Um, but giving haircuts is a very, analog, person to person. This is an offline business. It's never going to be fully online, at least yeah. I don't think so until. <laughs> so I think, you know, because it's that traditional retail business and we work with franchisees from all over and they're very um, focused on, you know, still doing a lot of print, a lot of couponing, a lot of very traditional um, marketing tactics. And so I think Trying, I didn't think it would take this long to, to try to get us to shift to digital. 
it's one silver lining of the pandemic actually because yeah. we've had to we've been forced to shift uh to more digital channels and it is they're performing well and so it's finally kind of getting us over that that curve and that caution that we have it, it feels like we're on the cusp of sort of like when the internet came about and it changed, you know, I remember the first time I bought something on the internet and used my credit card online and thought, right. is this safe? Is this secure? I don't know, but, but I'm willing to try it because, you know, we, we it was clear we were headed in that direction. Right. I almost feel like this is a time and place in our history where a lot of big transition will happen quickly. Would you agree with that? Yes. I agree. And we're seeing it happen. We're seeing it happen with our technology and our, especially our app, because people are being really forced to plan ahead. They don't want to spend a lot of time in our salons. And so they have to use the app in order to not have, have that wait time experience. And so we're seeing a, a lot of adoption of our app. Which is great. So for example, you may have had a real struggle to try to push to get people to use the app and you knew you wanted to get them to use it. And now you've got this outside event and and, and, and force that's causing the adoption that you it's sort of like i remember many 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 years ago verizon was a new company i think that merged a couple of companies together and they were really really worried about people being able to pronounce verizon not say verizon and there was some kind of a i think there was a strike that happened okay so it was in the news a lot and they said verizon this and verizon that and it forced people to know how to say verizon so the strike wasn't good for their business but it ended up being long term for their brand right that's great that's great so so you've been at great clips for about three years now and and what has kept the role let's say what kept the role interesting for you even february you know as of february um you know, what's keeping the role interesting for you beyond just the changes that have happened recently, most recently? I mean, I love innovation and Great Clips is a haircutting company, obviously, first yeah. and foremost, but they really innovate around the haircut. So using technology to make the customer experience as seamless as possible. And we know our customers want to get in and out quickly and and not waste time when getting a haircut. And so using technology has been, that was, it really drew me to Great Clips in the first place and the ability just to continue innovating and uh, use my experience from an innovation standpoint to continue to grow and drive that has, has really been exciting. And I think just the ability to work within a smaller company and we have, we're a $2 billion um, annual revenue company and we have 4,500 salons across the U.S. and Canada. So we're big in that aspect, but um, small in terms of, you know, the structure of the company and how decision making happens and really the focus and strategy and outlook of the company. And so it's nice that we're just simply focused on haircuts, but then we're, uh, we have that ability to innovate around and that keeps it exciting. Very cool. Well, so where do you find inspiration maybe outside of either the company or even outside of marketing? Like what's the, how do you find inspiration? Um, I mean, from a marketing standpoint, I find inspiration in just following a lot of my former leaders and people that I have worked with. Having worked at a lot of big companies, especially Best Buy where people have left and gone, gone on mm-hmm. to other, you know, big uh, marketing leadership roles and just, seeing what they're doing and, and knowing how they operate and, you know, their values and their perspective and, and learning from that um, is definitely inspiring. So like you like to kind of make connections. I like to try to keep those connections mm-hmm. and learn from those leaders who, um, who are, you know, making really great, great decisions when it comes to marketing and innovating and just leaning yeah. on them for advice. Is there a company that you admire from afar that you just like, either you admire their marketing or you just admire something interesting about them that they're doing? Uh, you know, I still admire Best Buy. I, you know, mm-hmm. having worked there for nine years, I, and just knowing the challenges they they go through quite yeah, a bit. It's tough right now too. Yeah. Right, right. And so I admire a lot of the decisions that Best Buy has made. I used to, I used to work um, with Corey Berry quite a bit. And so just following her and, and seeing her as a female leader as well is just really um, empowering and inspiring to watch. Uh, yeah, I guess I, I focus on retail a lot now that I think about it. So even, you know, having worked um, 
for Greg Ravel, who now is the CMO at Kohl's, and watching him and how they're making decisions and how they've had to become so much more agile in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, their their campaigns and the decisions they make for marketing and how they go from idea to execution. Um, so while retail struggles, just finding ways that people are trying to overcome and innovate and do new things and do them quickly, um, definitely Fantastic. inspiring to me. Um, and so I'm gonna shift to leadership and just in terms of what are the most important values that you demonstrate as a leader or that you maybe even demand from people on your team? Are there certain values that are important to you? Yeah, I mean, the first two things that come to mind would be transparency. I'm a very transparent leader. I just think the more communication, the more open and honest you are with your team, uh, the more you become a team and working together to figure things out. So I'm very transparent when I don't understand any something or a situation and I have an expert on my team who does, I, you know, I really dig in to try to understand and learn it. And, or if I have information that maybe even at, at that point shouldn't be shared, I try to kind of balance that with, if I share it, are we going to make a better decision in the end? Mm -hmm. And um, so that, and I would say just empathy, understanding, mm -hmm. especially now, understanding um, what people are going through, all the different situations we're in as a team and um, just, just trying to be empathetic with, with everything that everyone's going through. Yeah. With the, with the transparency piece, I had a conversation actually earlier today with a friend who we were talking about the times when we've received really, really difficult feedback and, and really, you know, when people challenged us with something that wasn't, was difficult for us to hear. Those are the times when we've grown the most. And right. learned the most. So I don't, maybe, uh, Talk about a time when either you received really difficult, candid feedback or had to deliver really difficult, candid feedback and, and what an impact that made either on you or the person. Yeah, I mean, I would say I just went through that actually during this, during this whole stay home order situation, which made it even more difficult because you're not face to face in person with the person you're giving the feedback to. Yeah. And it was a situation where I, you know, I, I kind of understood where, where my team member was coming from and where things weren't moving as fast as he would have liked. And, and, you know, he didn't, he didn't like that it was so process oriented versus like, just get it done oriented and just how he handled the situation wasn't, wasn't ideal. And so I had to give him that feedback and it, and it had happened a few times in, in that moment. And believe me, I hate giving feedback like that. It's just, it's hard to even give, you know, as a leader. Um, but, and I, and I thought he would respond in an extreme negative way, especially since we were doing this via a Zoom call. Um, but he handled it with such dignity and such positivity and, and uh, that definitely learned from that and almost learned how to take feedback from the person I was giving feedback to because huh. of that situation. So. That's amazing, yeah. And I think um, it tells you something about that person's character. Right. Really you could either fold under that feedback or you could take it for what it is the, a value and internalize it and, and learn from it and get better. Right. Absolutely. That's, that's great. So um, this is one other piece on the leadership and just what advice would you give to somebody that's entering maybe a role similar to yours? Like if, they, if somebody just newly got promoted to head of marketing for, for a large organization, what advice would you give them? Um, I would give them advice to, to really not, not expect themselves to know everything, mm. right? To have all the answers, to be the expert on every topic. Mm. And I came from big company. I mean, when I was an entrepreneur, I had to know everything, right? But, but, um, but I came from big companies where there was, you had resources for every single specialty area, functional area within marketing and outside of marketing. And when you go to a company where you all of a sudden are responsible for all of it, um, everything from creative to media, digital, traditional, everything, um, to not, not try to expect yourself to know everything or act like you know everything, but really jump in, understand, understand the people on your team who do have the answers and do have those specialty areas and lean on them and lift them up um, through that. Because uh, that was quite overwhelming to me when I first got my questions around um, 
different areas such as I, I just remember one in specific uh, on traditional media on print. And I mean, I, I really hadn't had that experience. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. um, it's around how to find the right people on your team who do have that knowledge. And love it. So uh, shift the topic to agencies. So I'm just curious how you work with marketing agencies today. Do you, do you have one main agency? You have a lot of different agencies and how do you work with them today? So at Great Clips, because we're a franchise or organization and because our ad fund budget is, is uh, directly related to franchisee revenue, they pay 5% right. of their revenue into an ad fund fee. We rely on agencies a lot. We do not have a lot of in-house Mm -hmm. uh, creative or, or media type people. So we rely a lot on agencies and we have several agency partners. We do have a primary agency for media. We have a separate agency for creative that are really our focus agencies that we work on, um, that we work with the most. Um, but then we have a lot of specialty agencies. We work with a sports marketing agency. Mm -hmm. We work um, and just a lot of partnership marketing agencies. So we work in a lot of, with a lot of different specialty agencies as well. And we rely on them a lot. They're mm -hmm. very close partners. They're very engaged. Uh, they're just almost part of our team, I would say. And how do you get them to work well with each other and keep from trying to encroach on each other? We, we set that expectation from day one. And again, because I focus so much on transparency, I'm transparent with them all the time in mm -hmm. terms of, you know, look, we're, we're, we're talking to several of you about this idea and, right. you know, we're going to come up with the best idea that works for all of us. And then once we have it, we all need to work together to, to make it come to life. Um, but, and I would say that through the whole selection process, we make it very clear that we all work together. Yeah. Um, so actually that brings me up to a good point is how do you go about choosing a new partner? And, you know, are there certain traits you're looking for when you're selecting a new agency? Yeah. And because we've just gone through this recently, I'd say um, a lot of it is focused on finding an agency that has similar values to Great Clips. We, mm. we are very steeped in our values. We live our values mm. and having an agency partner who has similar values is extremely important to us. Uh, in addition to that, I would say the obvious things like franchise experience helps because mm -hmm. it's such a different model and you have to understand that mm -hmm. model. Mm -hmm. uh, and having multi-unit retail experience also helps understanding that whole um, offline versus online uh, mentality that we have where we are uh, a, a retail-based physical business, structure business, um, but how we rely on technology as well and digital to enable that is important for them to understand and have experience in delivering. Um, and, it, and a lot of it comes down to the team and who we're working with and the expertise they have. Uh, yeah. And, you know, Great Clips has grown up over time. So we had a lot of small, small partners that really helped build the business. And now we're so large with, with 4,500 uh, locations and 1200 franchisees that we're having to really grow up and um, and choose agencies that have the support structure that we need because it's, it's a lot. Yeah, we found that generally brands seek agency support for two reasons. Either they're missing some capacity, like they don't have enough mm -hmm. arms and legs to do the work, or they're missing some capability to your point, right. like sports marketing or something where there's a particular expertise that you just don't have on the team. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, just generally, if you think um, it's better to work with a more generalist agency that has a lot of different capabilities or more specialists that have very specific, because if you work with a lot of specialists, you have to manage more agencies and it's work, mm -hmm. but you may get more expertise. Whereas if you work with a more general agency, you know, fewer to manage, um, but maybe not as much discipline expertise. Yeah, I think we found having the discipline really helps in our area uh, and, and just setting up the structure early on where we do work together. I mean, mm -hmm. we try to limit the number of agencies we have for that reason because I just don't have enough internal resources on my team to even manage lots and lots of agencies. So um, we have, a, I would say we have probably four or five key agencies that we work with very closely. They're specialized in specific areas, mm -hmm. and we really make sure that there's a lot of collaboration uh, and partnership. We bring them together, at least 
pre-COVID. We brought, we yeah. brought them together. Now virtually, maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And now we're on Zoom calls all the time. I would say we're even together more often because it's just easy. And yeah, there's no travel time to deal with. <laughs> exactly. And I think even within that, we work with a lot of partnerships. So just even early this morning, I was on a call with the NHL and we were talking about our NHL campaign that we're bringing to life for playoffs. And we had three different agency partners on that call because they all have to kind of get the same message and then go off quickly because we're working so fast mm -hmm. and deliver their part of the plan. So, um, so a couple of questions just about results. One, one is how do you really show the value of marketing to either the larger organization, you know, the non-marketing part of the organization, and in your case, even to the franchisees who are paying 5% of their revenue into the fund, how do you really show them that you're delivering value, you know, through marketing? Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not an easy uh, answer, right, really, but at Great Coast, what's what I love is we, we have one primary key performance indicator, and that is growing customer counts. So the number of customers that come through the door, we're a volume-based business, and that is the most important thing. And so we, all, we always try to tie the marketing activi activities that we do and the dollars we spend back to showing how it drives customer count growth um, profitably. So, yeah. so we're all about that. Uh, and, you know, it's helped with a lot of the attribution that we can do nowadays. Um, and we do a lot with discounting and different redemptions. So we're able to, to showcase it there as well. Um, but yeah, it's, and, and the franchisees demand it. And these yeah, these right. are their dollars and they want to know that it's, that it's paying back and it's having a positive ROI. In addition to that, from a brand standpoint, because we do a lot of, of brand campaigns and advertising as well. It's, it's very focused on, we do research, we do tracking research. To that promoter score kind of stuff to be able to yeah. say, like, are we getting brand lift from what we're doing? Yes, yes exactly. Cool. Yeah. So is there a particular campaign that you're either, either in your current role or even in a past role that you're just super proud of that just really felt like it made a big impact? Um, I mean, the one that just comes to mind right now is one that we just did actually when we couldn't even give haircuts. <laughs> Right. And it was because of how it came to life so well and how authentic and organic it was that it performed extremely well because of that. Mm -hmm. And that was, we did a campaign around stay home hair and it was a pretty low budget campaign, but it fit the time. It, you know, it fit the mindset of what our customers were going through right now and that they couldn't go get a haircut. None of, no salons were open and yeah. there wasn't even the chance to do that. And we were able to quickly pull it together again in like a very organic way. We created a video spot focused only on digital and social and um, as well as earned media. We also worked with our partners. So we, like I mentioned, we have the NHL partnership. We also have the, uh, we have a partnership with Monster Jam. We have the Great Clips awesome. Mohawk wire truck through Monster Jam. So we partnered, we, we asked those partners to help us out and everyone stepped in and was willing to help participate in the campaign and really bring it to life. And I just, it was, it was just awesome how it all came together so well and then performed extremely well. And it was a good way to keep our brand alive while we couldn't service customers. Yeah. I, I feel like there's an opportunity. I'm going to give you a nice campaign idea right here. Which is, all right, I'll take uh, it. We, I think many of us really miss our stylist in a huge way. And so I almost would like to like, like send her a love letter um, <laughs> about how much I miss seeing her. And it's not, it's purely platonic, but, right. I, but, I, but, I, but, I, but I do miss it. And, and I think my, my wife and family misses it too. Um, right. Oh, I, yeah. I, shaved the beard after a couple of days and, and uh, is it, oh, you have a face under there. <laughs> well, it, it's funny you say that because within the stay home hair campaign, most of the comments that we, that we received uh, from social media were, were around how much they missed their stylist and shouting out to their stylist. Yeah. And so it was a great, it was great from a stylist engagement perspective as well. Awesome. Well, I have a couple of questions to wrap up that are just for fun. They're totally for fun. So, and you can pick, I'm going to rattle off a couple of questions and you can pick which one you want to answer. You can ignore the ones that are. So the first one is in which fictional story or realm would you most like to live? Yeah. 
The second one is, is there a quote, book or movie or band that inspires you? And then the third is, where do you find joy outside of work? Okay. So oh gosh. Three questions. I have a fourth too. We can try if you hate those, but those are the <laughs> three. We start. We'll start with you. Can pick one of those if you want. Well, I mean, I would say I think it probably relates to your first and last question that you asked. So around the what fictional story I would live in. I don't yeah. have a specific story, but uh, you know, when I think about it, I start with: Is it? Is it? Do I like the mountains more or, the island, or an island more? Am I a beach person or a mountain yeah. person? And I would definitely say more of a beach person. So I would be on some remote island in somewhere um, in, in some fictional story. So I don't with have the name of the story per se, water, but maybe you can. With lots of water sports and things? or Yes, like... lots of water sports, lots of relaxation. Yes. Cool. So, so it would be that. And that's what I love to do in my in my free time as well. I love to go anywhere warm and that has a beach and. Which is interesting because you live in, in Minneapolis, you live in Minnesota, right? Yeah, so that's why you need that even more. You need the yeah, beach even it's an escape. <laughs> uh, I, I recently went and watched the entire Star Wars sequence with my kids. And so I've got, that would be kind of fun to, to live right. in Star Wars uh, was my thing. So the, <laughs> the other one that I think is there a book or movie or a quote or a band that really inspires you? I mean, it's kind of cliche, but I say it all the time and I use it with my kids as well Is you know, the Helen Keller quote, life is a daring adventure. Or it's nothing at all because I really truly believe that. And back to that comment on where I'm fearless, I just believe in just living life as, daring as it might be and trying new things and seeing where it takes you. Um, and it's just all about experiences and memories and just trying to make the most of it. So. Wow. Awesome. All right. So that's it. Lisa Hakey. Thanks so much for spending the time with Thank me. Thank you, really Joe. It's it. great.